like to make little points before we begin our reading. So I just wanted to share an idea. It may or may not be repetitious to you. But I mean, if you look at, I mean, and this is going to continue throughout because in, in Genesis, as we go through the story of the patriarchs, we see again and again that the focus is on children. It's funny, we were just talking about um, Ross's great grandkids. And that's really interestingly enough, the point I wanted to, to talk about, which is the importance of children, the importance of grandchildren, the importance of, of a legacy, a human legacy. And um, that we, we see that when God's speaking to the patriarchs, and that despite Abraham's wonderful qualities, and despite the fact that according to our sages, the tradition is that he made many converts, so to speak. He, he brought many, very likely thousands to, you know, um, be believers in the one God, in the one God. So despite all that, we don't see that that's the emphasis of God's discussions and the prophecy and the destiny of Abraham and Isaac and finally Jacob. And we find Jacob, I mean, we haven't gotten there yet, but Jacob is the, is the, the final branch on which from him develops the nation because all of his sons remain within the fold. And... Um, Again, uh, no big innovations here, but simply the point is the importance of, uh, I think we can learn a lesson, is what I'm really saying. Um, not just is it that we see that, that the mission of the, the Jewish people has to do with being a nation and as opposed to maybe so much reaching out, is a much more emphasis on just being an example and and being the best nation they can be, as opposed to um, proactively reaching out. Again, we can argue about that. I mean, there obviously Maimonides is known to state that there's an obligation to teach the seven laws to the nations. But the fact is, biblically, we, we don't see God, this doesn't seem to be the emphasis. I mean, again and again, God speaks to Abraham and the patriarchs and says, you're going to, you know, your, your offspring will inherit this land and you'll be a blessing to the nations. I mean, that's really what we see again and again, that concept. The, the interaction with the nations is more that they'll be praised, that they'll be an example, that they'll bring blessing, but uh, not really the talk of teaching directly. I think it's more teaching by example. And because uh, that's the idea of a blessing is that people will say, oh, you should be blessed like so-and-so. You know, that you just like, um, you know, Ephraim and Manasseh, or, you know, you should, so that the children of Israel will be such an example that people will learn from them. But, but the meaning then is that primarily to be in just an extraordinary example. And because of that, God will bless Israel. And because of that, all the nations will learn. However, if they don't do that, then we have a lot of problems because then what happens is, well, first of all, if, the, if God punishes the Jewish people and destroys a temple, so the nations, they can either learn the right message and say, oh, the, God's people sinned and they're being punished and we have to learn from this. But they can also learn the wrong message, which is, oh, we beat God, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar does. You could think the nation say, oh, you see, our, our beliefs are correct. And, you know, they, the Jewish people are falling into um, deterioration. So it's a lose for everyone. Not only do the children of Israel fall into a decay or into a slump, or however you want to call it, but the nations also get the, can get the wrong message. <clears throat> But anyway, getting back to the point that we can all learn from is that the main thing is to bring up children, and there should be a continuity of the values of the seven laws and belief in God. <clears throat> that seems to be, I mean, if we, in other words, if we extract, if we could extract, extract, extrapolate a lesson from the mission that God gave to the patriarchs, I think that would be it. 
that's the mission, you know, the children of Israel. But I think there's also a mission for everyone because we look at the patriarchs. At that time, they were children of Noah. They were not, they didn't have any special classification. And the main point was that they should have children and children's children that should follow in their ways. That was the main point. And I think it remains the main point. The main point is to your family, you should give over your values to you know, your, your children and their children to the best of your ability and have children and, and build a family. <clears throat> okay, so that was my first point. In fact, it's interesting that um, trying to think uh, where it is that uh, where it is that Rashi brings this, but Rashi brings in one of the these parishes lately, I, I can't recall offhand where it is. He says someone who doesn't uh, have children is like someone who mur- is like a murderer. If I'm not mistaken. That's what he says. In other words, there's an idea of potential children. Look, obviously, some people just don't succeed. That's not the point. The point is that someone who is lax and doesn't seek to have children, then that person is, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> um, extinguishing that potential is a type of, you know, not literally, obviously, but in a certain sensitive type of a way, it's a form of, you um, murder in that all the potential life that could have come is not brought about. So obviously the whole idea of, of, uh, that we're going to see later on in Genesis and the parishes that talk about Aaron Onan, um, Judah's sons, and the, the commission of the, the waste of, of seminal uh, of, of wasting of seed and so on that it discusses there and God's anger, quote unquote, about, about that. It's a similar idea, the idea of potential life, potential human life being, and wasting potential human life being extremely severe. Obviously, you can extrapolate in regards to abortion in the same way. Not to get into the debate, was there any point when it may be permitted or not, but certainly just... Um, Ideal, ideally, it's not something. It's, it goes against what God wants. We want to, we want to, um, be, you know, we want to increase life, increase human life, and to a great extent, the greatest holiness a person can bring into the world is to bring in another human life, to all its different facets and uh, and possibilities. But the point is, it's another image of God the person brings into the world. So. Okay. So I guess just to finish off the conversation, um, teaching people who are not our biological children uh, seems to also be a form of reproduction because um, our sages seem to say in so many so often that that um, <clears throat> children can mean students, and when the verse says that you should teach thy children, it actually means students. So from here we can extrapolate that to teach and to bestow upon another a way of life. It's like bringing up a child. So that's another way if someone can't have the children, but if the way we affect others, and if we affect particularly younger people, and as an example, and change the way they live, it's also like having children. Okay. Now I'm on one page 184, and we're going to discuss idolatry itself. Finally, at the level, the the deepest level of impurity and distance and confusion, and the most destructive level of misconception that a person can have. 
Dalatu. And we're in the practice of universal ethics, chapter seven, belief in God, page 184. Idolatry. In terms of the relationship of God and creation, idolatry is a further step from the unity of God, which takes a created entity and, and forgetting or denying God makes this entity its sole object of worship. Okay? So... <clears throat> it's a further step away from the unity of, of God is a belief is making this, this other entity one sole object of worship. <clears throat> so I mean, if the idea of the unity of God means his aid is nothing but God, and that all existence and being comes from him, and all energy and power and, and vitality comes from him. And this is the opposite, that the person seeks to worship and, and puts a, some other entity on, on, on a, a, um, an absolute level and, 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 uh, gets, and takes God out of the picture completely. <clears throat> Idolatry in this regard consists in worshiping as absolute, quote, as God, so to speak, something created by God. Whether this is a physical, spiritual, or other non-physical entity, this is a very important statement he's making here because usually when you think about idolatry, you think about, you know, Zeus and Mars and all the, you know, all the pagan gods of the past, right? Think of mostly human images, or assume maybe the stars, the moon, and so on, physical entities. What are you saying? No, not necessarily. It can even be something else. It can be, even be non-physical. It can still be idolatry. Thus, one who regards the sun or the moon as the first principle of creation is an idolater. Someone who regards the sun and the moon as the first things created I should say the, the creators of everything else is an idolater. But also one who takes a concept such as human autonomy and makes it the ultimate principle of creation. All right, so this is interesting. So what about someone believes that a human being himself is absolute. There is no power above a human being. A human being has complete free ability to do and show whatever it wants. And that's what the person believes in. Nothing else. Believes in himself. Maybe other human beings. So he argues here that that's also idolatry. He seems to be quite literal. It's not it's like it's like idolatry. He seems to classify it in the literal sense. That an absolute humanism, in which the person believes that the ultimate absolute Value is the is is the human is a form of idolatry because it's making something else absolute besides God. Heaven forbid. <clears throat> Next sentence: the materialism of communism, which says that the material matter with its presumed laws is the ultimate principle of reality, is also idolatry. And it's taken and created an entity matter and made it absolute. So if we say that the natural world as we know it, for example, the laws of physics and matter that we see is absolute, that there's nothing that's controlling it, that's directing it, but <clears throat> it is as we found, find it and the buck stops there, there's nothing else. There's nothing else besides it. He's saying that's a form of idolatry. That, that's also idolatry. In other words, a belief in materialism and that there's nothing else, that's idolatry. So it almost would sound like according to this, atheism is also idolatry. Then. Atheism is not um, a, a separate category. 
It sounds like it may be idolatry. Let's see. He goes on to discuss this. So too is pantheism idolatrous. The belief that the earth and living things are like some type of unified uh, life energy. You know, that, that's, that's the ultimate. Um, that's also idolatry. Or it makes the creation itself into an absolute or first principle. That the creation is, is its own God. In that way, it's kind of like uh, there are people, they, they believe that there's like a common life energy between all living things. <clears throat> and that is the, the absolute. That might be idolatry. It's actually God is outside of creation, right? So that's interesting to note. <clears throat> According to that, it's, it sounds like uh, that Star Wars may be idolatry. <laughs> the idea of the force, of this energy force between all living things, sounds closer to pantheism than to uh, modern theism. Okay. To the extent that atheism is rooted in a materialistic doctrine, which regards matter or the physical creation as all there is, it is itself idolatrous. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think all modern atheism falls in this category. The way that they know that there's, that, you know, there's no God, the way they quote prove it is from, you know, natural processes where they say, well, we can't we can't test God. We do tests and He's not there, or you know, things like that. But we would basically say that if we can't prove it and see it, then then we can't believe it exists. Which is the same idea that the absolute truths is the material world, and outside the material, nothing exists. <clears throat> That's a form of idolatry. That's a belief that matter is the ultimate existence of the universe. Any questions so far on this, on this profound addition to our understanding of idolatry? <clears throat> <clears throat> 